Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Welcome back on the Agri Adventures channel. This is Simone Berliat. And today we are going through an interesting experience. We have a live online on the radio, on Facebook, and obviously we will be available on many other platforms later. And uh, sorry, I'm fighting a little bit with the technology. <laughs> As usually, that's what's happened. As I said, we are live on many platforms. So today we have uh, a couple guests for today. Uh, so I would like to welcome uh, Malcolm. Malcolm is the, one of the team members at the Ligaya Garden and uh, located north of Adelaide. Malcolm, you can unmute your microphone if you want. And also, I would like to welcome uh, Bianca. Uh, thank you, Bianca, for being with us. Uh, Bianca is a scientist, entrepreneur uh, based at Waitea Campus. So during this episode, we have a, a mine a part, uh, which is uh, the, uh, correlated with the garden. And then we will speak uh, uh, with Malcolm about uh, garden practice uh, correlated with the pest control and predator control. And then with Bianca, we will speak with her about uh, the um, amazing sensory experiences she has designed and she's running at the uh, YTA campus, um, uh, which is, I've been part participating a couple of times. It was really, really fun. So uh, welcome everybody. Hello. Hi. Hi. And uh, so thank you for being on the Agri Adventures platform. It's so exciting to be able to do these type of things. It's a new format. Uh, looking for the future to have uh, uh, more of this interesting content on uh, the platform available for everybody to access, but also sharing uh, these events and interesting experiences that are happening here in South Australia, Adelaide, not really far away from our homes. Really, really interesting, really, really cozy, I can say, and uh, definitely a good support for the local uh, community and the local economy. Uh, so, uh, Bianca, we're going to start uh, to speak with Malcolm, if it's not a problem uh, for you. And then, uh, so, uh, welcome, Malcolm. And uh, could you please tell uh, uh, to us a little bit about uh, you? Good day, everybody. I'm Malcolm. Um, I'm part of what we call the Gaia Garden. Uh, I've got some chickens just come over to investigate all the fuss is about so you'll hear some clucking and bucking and things but just bear with that <laughs> it's one of the joys of actually living in a in a productive garden um yeah we have a small block out in gaula uh only 360 square meters and we uh produce more than half of our food we share it with the local community we do a whole bunch of good stuff out here and mostly it's all organic as much as we can i do have to import some commercial fertilizer from time to time to balance out the micronutrients, which I don't have a lot of control over at the moment. And apart from that, all our herbs, all our medicines, most of our food all comes from a small block. Uh, we have a website, ligaiagarden.online, and that um, explains everything we do too. So if you want to get a, have a look at that at some time, I'm sure, I'm sure Simone can share the link with you. Um, yeah. So we, we're three people here and a dog and four chickens. And you'll probably see them all walk by at some time or another. <laughs> it's a very cozy space, very cozy space. And very cozy. I think that's the word that you used earlier for Adelaide, Simone. Mm. Cozy. And uh, a question, uh, do you use uh, organic principles or do you use some uh, regenerative agricultural principles? You do a mix? Um, uh, mix, definitely a mix. Um, we basically um, just work on trying to reuse what we can from the garden, repurpose that back into the soil and into the plants. Um, there's a lot of community efforts. We have a, a community composting network out here at, um, at Gawler where we pick up um, scraps and coffee grounds from certain restaurants and cafes in the boost bar. And then that all gets converted into compost or fed to the chickens and the worms. Um, as I mentioned before, the only thing we have to import really is um, straw for the chickens because we don't have enough space to grow grain mm -hmm. and uh, some commercial fertilizer from time to time, soluble fertilizer for the micronutrients because I can control potassium, phosphorus, nitrogen, calcium, all that sort of stuff. Mm 
-hmm. But things like boron and molybdenum and things like that, which are all essential for the um, the plants, it's a bit harder to control. You need a full-on lab for that. Uh, Bianca um, probably Bianca is, is saying yes. Yeah. So maybe she could <laughs> say something about it, but <laughs> we could also we could introduce something one day about it. It'll yeah. be really, really oh. interesting. Anyway, the, the key is is not to try and do it all yourself, but to spread as much out in the community as you can. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, and that's what we've done. And yeah, so we managed to produce phenomenal amounts of stuff here by just sharing and repurposing and putting things through. Um, we don't use any poisons here at all. I was really angry the other day when one of the neighbors poisoned along the fence line with um, glyphos, but what can you do? It's their house, their property. Um, and that's why I decided to talk about pests today because um, for the last year, we haven't done any pest control at all, besides okay. finding besides finding slugs and stepping on them. That's the only <laughs> that's the only thing. Well, and chickens. I know well, that chicken. they, they do a, lot, a bit of cleaning for bugs and things like that. Maybe I'm going to introduce something at the topic. So <laughs> I'm clearing out the surprise. Yeah, chickens do a great job, but because it's such a small block, um, ours stay confined into their chicken run most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, we let them out once a week or in the really hot weather we let them out every day to find their own places but basically any bugs that I do find any pest bugs go into a little bucket while I'm gardening mm -hmm. and they get fed to the chickens and they still do their job like that keep yeah. the numbers down and then when they get let out they run amok and um, do chicken things you know yeah. what they're best at just one thing I know that it should be on me I'm not really familiar with this procedure because I'm Italian, but I would <laughs> like to thank and uh, I would like to remember the respect for the uh, Kaurna people, mm -hmm. their oh, yeah. country and their land. And uh, that's something that I, I was looking to introduce. I don't know what you say, sorry, I don't know the right words, but hopefully the people that's following us understand that remember the past is really important, has remember and understand for the future is really important to, we to do together. We usually point out that the land was never ceded, never given up. So they're technically, they're still the custodians. Mm, and their culture, it continues. It's not, a, not in the past. We often talk about them in the past, but the culture continues now. So important. Okay, so um, now you introduce a little bit the topic uh, about the controlling pest and controlling uh, with, uh, with predators. Uh, yeah. Something that um, I know, for instance, by my own experience, uh, with about the biodynamic, biodynamic, which is was uh, coming from Austria, something that my mom had been using in the past. Um, there was an interesting technique that was used with bugs, which was the pests were, were coming, uh, they were collect, they were burned on to ashes, and they were mixed in water, mm -hmm. and they were spried in the garden. So <laughs> I was looking to mention this because it's a kind of, uh, it looks like more, uh, uh, you know, folk or more folkloristic, if you want to say, they're not correlated with science, but there's people that's using it. And then there's one way how they do this type of uh, pest management using biodynamic. Uh, what's your technique? How do you do that over there? Well, um, biodynamics is actually something that I aspire to. I want to get to the, the level of um, control and expertise that the biodynamic practitioners um, get to. But because every, every single biodynamic garden or farm I've seen is just wonderfully productive and lush. And, um, but I'm not quite at that stage yet. Um, basically, what I believe is that, and it goes along the same lines as you mentioned before about burning the, the bugs and that, because they take the nutrients out of your plants. So by doing what you mentioned, you're putting it back in again. There is another technique where you get the live bugs and you basically blend them into a blender and make a mix out of them and then spray that back on the plant. And the idea of that is that introduces the microorganisms that prey on that bug and then they eat the bugs and kill them off. Because a lot of gardening actually is about um, I call it wrangling microbes. It's, it's about looking after your microbes and your biota in the, the soil. And once you learn about that, then it's, um, it's all quite easy from there. Hmm. Um, 
pests and that there's there's interesting yeah there's there's many many different ways of doing pest control um my favorite is just as a, as we're talking about with this topic is just to let the predators come in this year um based on what i learned previous five we've only been doing this for six years here um is that there'll be a a burst of problem pests but then the predators will come in and they'll slowly take over and they'll rebalance it so as long as you're patient and even if you do spray just the basics like soapy water or things like that leave a few plants i call them sacrificial plants mm -hmm. let the pests come onto them and keep an eye on them until the predators start to arrive and then you can stop the rest of the pest control in your garden except for picking off caterpillars and squashing slugs and snails uh, we have a couple of blue tongue lizards here so snails are no problem for us we've never had a snail problem mm -hmm. airwigs are a minimal problem and the only real problem we do have is with slugs in winter and just being careful and picking them and feeding them to the chickens oh, i'm getting a bit glary behind I, might yeah, just I was actually going to ask if it was a possible for you to move the camera slightly away from the sun yeah i might actually move just inside because oh, um okay yeah but trying to do it in the garden but since we started the sun's moved so, so we for the people that's following us that is following obviously through the radio they won't be able to see it but you can understand he was sitting malcolm was sitting in the garden and he yeah. was looking to show and share with us that tree over there but obviously it's not a perfect condition for the camera but that's yeah. okay we tried and now the sun's moved so it's um yeah. it's different now but is this okay now that's perfect how are we excellent um so where were we yeah letting the let, keeping a few sacrificial plants around the place to let the the pests build up and then let the, the, let the predators come in um one thing we have a big problem here with is red spider mites and okay. everybody i know has a problem with those in adelaide they love the dry conditions and you'll see the leaves getting freckled and, and even turning a bronze color you'll see small webs very fine webs on the plants and that's a sign that you're being infested with red spider mites but can i just share a picture here yeah uh let me see how we go here um just for a second yep this is my first time sharing anything so it's new to me <laughs> right let's come here and i'll go to spider mites can you see that image there uh not yet not yet okay Not yet. what's going on we're sharing the screen desktop here share okay how's that oh wow okay yep you see these little ones here this is actually a good sign this because many many have died on our plants oh. but you'll see the tiny tiny smart this is taken with a, a digital microscope mm -hmm. and they get to this kind of population they get gigantic numbers and what we do is we just shared that one so now i'll change to this one we wait until we see um almost little black full stops can you see that now that little beetle mm -hmm. yeah that's called a uh, a lady bird beetle mm -hmm. and what you'll see in your spider mite infested plants is like little tiny full stops moving around these are only about a oh, millimeter, two millimeters big, but they'll eat their body weight in spider mites every day. And they'll just keep going and going and going. So once you see them going, you can take a hands off approach to your, yeah. your spider mite problems. You were speaking about uh, the ladybird, uh, sorry, the, the lady, uh, well, because you opened the, 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 um, the wall uh, desktop. So there were a few, uh, few insects in front of us. Yeah. That's a ladybird beetle. Okay, perfect. Okay. It's a little bit different to a ladybird. Same yeah, exactly. Thing. That's what yeah. I was wondering. So it's a tiny one. I like that. Tiny. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they'll eat. Um, and once you see those little full stops moving, you can just have a rest. But often one of the best ways to deal with spider mites and white fly and that sort of thing is just with water. Just when you hose the plants, when you're watering, hit the bottom underneath, underneath the leaves hit that with water just straight out of your tap and that disturbs them that knocks the eggs off and knocks the critters off 
and um, it'll do a lot of your work for you. And if you're feeling really, really desperate and your plants are getting really knocked, just some water with a little tiny bit of vinegar and a tiny bit of um, detergent from your, your kitchen, and that'll get in and knock them off. But the main thing to remember is anything like this, you need to do at least every three days. Because when you see the bugs, then there's already lots of eggs there. And those eggs take two or three days to hatch, then you're hitting the next lot. And you may need to do that a few times. And then you'll notice your plants stop getting damaged so much. Um, but yeah, white fly and red spider mice, they're the biggest problem here in South Australia. And once you get predators in there, like we, up until last year, we had enormous amounts of white fly on our kale. And I was hitting it with soapy water every day and all kinds of things. And this year I've done nothing and the problem's gone away. There's always one or two, but that's not an issue. You know, the predators are here. Yeah. And the so, other thing, yep. sorry. Uh, I was yeah, about yeah. the other thing people complain about is the green caterpillars. Okay. The, the little caterpillars that kind of loop along when you when you get on your cabbages and things. There's actually several species of wasp around. Tiny, tiny wasps that you almost can't see. And they'll lay their eggs in those caterpillars. And then those eggs will hatch out and they'll eat the caterpillar from inside. <laughs> it's quite gross sounding. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> but you'll notice, you know, you, you'll see a little caterpillar and you'll see like little lumps all over it. Mm -hmm. And once you see that, then you can stop your control. Unless you see, you know, if you see a caterpillar, you can squish it um, because, you know, the wasps are taking care of it for you. And interesting fact, green caterpillars are edible and they taste like whatever they've been um, eating on. So if you've got it on broccoli, they taste like broccoli. If you've got them on lettuce, you've got them on lettuce, yeah. <laughs> okay, so if, I gonna, if I'm going to put them on grapes and I leave them ferment, do they taste wine? That's a good idea. We'll try it, Simone. We'll try this year. <laughs> you know, considering, considering the boom of uh, uh, native plants and uh, native food uh, uh, that's happening at the moment on the market, this is could yeah. be a new dish putting on the, on the table. I wonder we can put them on pizza, we can put them on chips, all kinds of things. <laughs> Be careful what you do on pizza. Be careful. <laughs> <Sacred>. <laughs> I'm Italian. Be careful. <laughs> this is a taker. Okay, we'll we'll, we'll just, stay off of that topic. Just, just joking. Uh, so, yeah. question, uh, uh, Malcolm. Uh, if anybody will be interested to learn more about this type of uh, pest control, would they mm -hmm. be able to come along to the garden, and would you be able to introduce them to this concept? Or yeah, yeah, we we hold workshops. We hold um, small group tours. We've got one coming up next week. I like to have a group of about five people if I can, because the garden's very small mm -hmm. and five people is, is perfect. Everybody can get around and look at something. They can all hear what we're talking. We've had groups of 15, 20 people come and they have to line up out the front by the fence line. And it's all kind of disastrous like that. Yeah. But, yeah. That, so that we'll is, be booking. Uh, we have, we have the, we had the experience uh, with Bianca when, when we have been organizing her, her tour, Obviously, it's always a little bit of, uh, we need to have a balance because uh, you will like have enough people because obviously part of these tours are businesses. So mm -hmm. having more people is a good thing, but also you want to give a great experience and you want to That's transfer it. knowledge. It's the quality of the experience is important. Mm -hmm. So we might, do, we'll be doing hopefully an ongoing booking thing through Agri Adventures mm -hmm. where we book everything through you and um, people can book uh, eventually, when we get things up and running properly, just through your website. Oh, that would be really cool. That yeah. would be really cool. And um, okay, there is, uh, I believe there are seasons for uh, predators and for pests. Is that right? There are, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, winter, slugs and snails and things that are summer. Uh, early spring is pear slugs. Mm -hmm. And they're terrible. They're little tiny slimy things. Can I share a picture? Let me see if I can share a pear slug. Where's a pear slug? Um, can I move this one? Oh, yeah. Okay, can you see that little bundle yep. of jelly in there for the people that are on video? Yep. Tiny, they're about, oh, 
half a centimeter long, little jelly-like things, and they just strip. You can see the damage behind there on the leaf. And they'll come under pears and peaches and things at the beginning of the warm season. Luckily, before the fruit sets, and to control them, there's no predator control that I know of. Okay. But diatomaceous earth or anything powdery, like uh, a little bit of um, talcum powder, mm. corn, corn flour, or diatomaceous earth, that dries them out. It sort of sucks all of the moisture out of them. Yes, yes, that is something that most of my grandmother was doing in the garden. She was putting uh, lines of salt. Yeah. So they were like walls for them. They could slam themselves in front of this small line of salt because they were drying out. Yeah. Yep. I, so, see, I, I see Bianca nodding a lot about many things. Do you want to say something about the topic? Yeah, you're in Bianca. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay, but I'm agreeing with a lot of what you said. Um, you probably experienced with your parents and a little bit and a little bit of my hobbies and a yeah. little bit of my um, research and learnings but it's good to speak to kindred spirits <laughs> that's why my, my basic principle is that um, plants know what they've been doing they've been doing it for millions of years longer than we have pests mm -hmm. come along predators know what they're doing They've been doing it for generations. So we just encourage them and let them do, do what they need. I've been fortunate enough um, with my science experiences um, to meet some incredible researchers who are working in this space. And so you talked about the parasitic wasps and um, how people can treat things this is important in primary industry and a lot of that work is being researched here in Adelaide, which is fantastic. Yeah. And there's some incredible scientists um, researching this every day. So it's, it's, I'm also nodding because it applies in context to what I know. So. Also commercially, you can buy um, predatory mites to eat other mites. You can buy wasp eggs and fly eggs and things for different. And ladybird um, beetles. Yep. I Which I think is that, so exciting. I found this in my I've got video. This wonderful little thing in my worm farm the other day. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's got to be a, a pest. But when I looked it up, it's called a rove beetle, or the nickname is a red-headed flesh eater. <laughs> <laughs> and that just eats that's a voracious, voracious, voracious thing. Okay. It's the same with um, the soldier flies. You know, yeah. People get so put off when they see maggots and things on their green waste bins and organic bins and compost bins. Some of them are turning into soldier flies, which are incredible um, producers of larvae that yeah. you know break down that compost. So there's some cost composting systems that are just based on those flies. And interestingly, the mature flies they exude a pheromone that scares away normal house flies. And also the mature soldier flies don't have a mouth. No. Their whole function is to reproduce and then to die. <laughs> so I won't say anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> but there's so many little things in nature that if we know about, you know, we oh, can yeah. just accept that this, this insect is there doing its thing and it's beneficial to us. Yeah. Instead it's of seeing about it balance. Yeah. yeah, instead of seeing an insect and just squashing it. And I'll just share one more thing before I'm, I'm due to finish very short. Mm -hmm. But I'll just share one more little image for people. Um, as insects mature, they change. And they, this is not a good picture, but I'm not a very good photographer. This is the same insect that... Um, as this one, hang on, where are we? I'll just share this one again. Yeah, we want to mention the names for the people that's following yeah. the radio, otherwise they are going to think, oh, this is interesting insect. Yeah. Well, what it is. <laughs> so both of those were oh, okay. uh, green vegetable bugs, both of them. Okay. But as, as the bug matures from a larvae to uh, an adult, mm -hmm. they go through molts where the exoskeleton gets molted off. Yep. And the, each in, the stage in between each one of those is called an instar. That's the technical name for it. 
Now, often in bugs, like the, the, the vegetable bug there, each instar looks different. And I think that's to do with the where, where exactly they live on the plant and the camouflage and things. So I was familiar with the green vegetable bugs, but I had this other bug with the spots on it. And when I, I followed up on it, um, sure enough, it's the same bug, just a different stage, just an immature one. And I wonder, it makes me wonder how many bugs in my garden are just different stages of growth, which I don't know about. That's interesting. Definitely yeah, it's, it's just amazing. Yep. And they have different needs at different times as well. So, Malcolm, would you mind sharing your screen back to the desktop pictures there and double clicking on the lady be beetle larvae? Lady because beetle that's, larvae, okay. That's one for me that I learned the hard way. And yeah. I know so many people um, mm -hmm. don't realize it's a spotted lady be bird larvae oh. there. Yeah. So, if you see that in your garden and you've never seen it before, can you yeah. double click it, Malcolm? Zoom yeah, in. I just did. It's just taking a little while to load. Uh -huh. Here we are. Um, or maybe and it, just to sorry, maybe you have to share the the picture itself now because probably technically the system is not uh, sharing the picture. Okay. Well, that according to me, that's shared. Is that okay for you? You can't see it yet. No, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, Let me try one perhaps, more the, perhaps the listeners can uh, do a bit of googling. Have a look at the lady beetle life cycle and try that. How's that? That's oh, it. Yeah. And who would have thought was... you wouldn't think it? And so many people look at insects and think, I don't know what that is. Yuck, it must be a pet. Or yeah. it looks vicious, it must be a pet. When you get rid okay. of that, you're getting looks... rid of lady beetles and, and dragonfly just... larvae. They look they live underwater and they look so different to a dragonfly. They look like horrible. an armored vehicle. Vicious and mean. <laughs> Yeah, some sort of armoured vehicle. So it's about uh, hesitating before we act and spray and yeah. learn before we do it um, because it's so well, important. I, I think that a lot of people, they, uh, they do not have the time to develop the knowledge and follow these type of things. So they facilitate the process simply looking for a project that they can apply mm -hmm. and simply don't think about it till the next week or the next month. But as we learned from the experiences so far, uh, it's not beneficial for us in terms of health. Majority of these products, they are really strong and they go really deep in the soil and plants mm -hmm. and they do damages that we see in months or even years uh, later. So mm -hmm. it's a different approach. It's really, it's more gentle. It's more uh, for people that, is doing gardening not just because they want to possess fruits and veggies made by their self but they want to introduce their self in the beautiful world of uh, uh, the ecosystem in which we're living exactly so it's really it's really interesting uh, malcolm thank you very much okay. i think you can stop sharing these beautiful uh, insects which <laughs> is really 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 interesting how it's built Okay. And um, let me so, say one more thing before we finish. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I don't have to know all of the bugs. One thing that I found very successful is Google Lens. You take a photograph, you put it onto Google, and I've got reference books on bugs and insects and things. And so far, the success rate with Google Lens has been very good in accurately identifying mm -hmm. the, the bugs and even the, the different stages and the instars. So you don't have to know it all. Just rely on Go Dr. Google. <laughs> Dr. Google, well, it's, it's <laughs> technology that can be definitely helpful for us. So why not? Yeah. Why don't use it? Yeah. Exactly. Maybe it will be a chance after, if you have a second after the the episode, uh, if you can post maybe the the link or a couple of interesting topics uh, under the video, if you want, that will be okay. really appreciate for the people that's following us. Yeah. Or uh, we can organize to have something available for. Uh, the listeners uh, yeah, maybe. this week yeah. or uh, under the podcast because also for the listener again there will be a podcast about uh, today obviously and when we speak about pests and predators and uh, okay so now is uh, uh, Bianca time -da 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 -da. <laughs> oh, I'll just mute myself there and uh, we'll see Malcolm in a second before this episode ends okay so um, what I was looking to do with you, Bianca, I was looking to share 
this beautiful experience that I had uh, visiting your garden, maybe you can, maybe you'll, you will tell us about. I'm gonna just go over here and then uh, you can tell us a little bit more about what we are speaking. Okay, first of all, can you please tell us about your company? Siren is my endeavor to translate the science of the everyday world through crafts and workshops and experiences. So I am a biotechnologist by training, but it's been about five years since I've been behind the lab bench and I'm now a science communicator. So I'm creating experiences to help explain some of the things that are around us or concepts that apply to school kids, um, high school students and relate to their classroom learning or adults in communities um, who would just like to learn more about the world around them. The garden experience in particular, um, like you said, uh, Simona, you've come to some of those with me and they've been fun. Um, we kicked that off last year during the Nature Festival. And that was a great opportunity to invite people into what is already a public space. So I run these. Can you hear me okay? Is this okay? Say it, sorry. Can you hear me okay? Everything okay? Everything is okay, all good. Okay. Um, so we started these experiences last year and we do them at the Waite campus, particularly in the Herbre Rose Garden, the 20th century garden and the uh, sensory garden. So this is a public space um, where you're welcome to come in and explore explore and uh, you know, bring a picnic basket and sit down and have a look. And sometimes um, it's tricky with COVID and things like that, but often there are volunteers around who might um, do a garden tour or they might um, do a house tour. My tours are specifically um, run through Siren and I'll guide you through the seasonal situation of the ground. So, for example, if it's rose season, and we talk heavily about roses, um, or perhaps it's more a discussion on the native section, um, and we generally always end up in the sensory garden, where I try to discuss the science of food and flavor in a garden setting. So there's some beautiful plants there that have been set up by the volunteers of the Herbre Garden. Um, and they are tactile or very fragrant or even edible. And um, as I guide you through it, I talk to you about some of these plants, but I throw in the science behind it so that you can feel like there's um, an interesting story behind it. Uh, understanding how salvias or sages are related to both rosemary and lavender. Why? Um, what traits can you look for? Now, they're physical traits that we can look for with our experiences, but I can tell you the science behind it too. Or how uh, certain plants that exist um, in the space might look similar, but genetically not related. Um, how is that? Why is that? Um, so it's about um, exploring the space and learning about the gardens around us. Yeah, it's, uh, well, my side for the experience, when I had the chance of participating, it was really fun because obviously being trainer as a sommelier, the game of smells and flavors and scents is something that to me is really interesting, really fun. Mm. And then doing that with somebody that has the knowledge of uh, what there is behind the scenes, the chemical side, and how these things are working is a mind opening. It's like, mm. uh, uh, it's like having the other side of the book, you know, when you, you read yeah. just one part and you don't read the other page. And mm. so when having the chance to do that with somebody that you can speak about this, top this type of topic seriously, because, you know, now, if you go in a place and you say, I can smell roses, look at you, I say, you're weird. But when you are in a garden, you can finally yes. be us and say, oh, that's so fun. I love it. That's so mm -hmm. fun. 
Mm. And also I had the opportunity to see other parts of the garden. And there was this, I want to show with people, is this side uh, of the garden. I got the picture. And maybe you can tell something a little bit about it. That is oh. uh, uh, this sort of uh, cycle. That yeah, the labyrinth. Uh, yep. This is a labyrinth. I love this space. Um, my own children love this space. And speaking of which, they've just arrived home from their come out of the house so that mummy can talk so excuse the noise um but the labyrinth is um kind of at the point where the 20th century garden and the white arboretum meet <clears throat> and it's uh, essentially a maze but it's not like you know the tall maze where you get lost in it it's a walking through maze and i think it's designed on um Scandinavian labyrinths where it's about meditation and mindfulness and so I know as a student on campus and there are many other students on campus as we walked through um, you sort of feel this peaceful calm and it's a lovely space and kids love it um, but what I love about it is the um, biodiversity of the space so you go each season the trees change the landscape changes the mushrooms and the fungi growing on the logs um, change and they change color and they, um, the smells change, the animals change. The use of, you know, Malcolm was talking about predators and things like that, using plants as um, pest control. So often the uh, volunteers will plant crops of mustard mm -hmm. along the frame of the labyrinth because it's such an open space, the mustard produces natural repellent. Yep. And so it, um, it's a, I want to say like a biocide, but uh, that's not the word I want to use, but, um, and it prevents some insects. So, you know, learning about that in that environment, watching how that affects the labyrinth and its growth and things like that's great. And also all the logs used in the labyrinth are actually um, from felled trees in the way Arboretum. So it's a fantastic um, upcycling and nature play experience. I, just, I think it's lovely. It's very nice. Yeah. And uh, the, the, all the area, I think it's, it's really interesting, the Arboretum over there. And then I don't think it's uh, used enough from the, from the uh, other audience. I mean, that would be an amazing spot to do a picnic and discover mm. quiet. In some ways, also good means there is more time for us, but definitely an experience to, to, to go and discover. So if somebody is following, is interested, they can go on the Agri Adventures platform, they go in the experiences section, and they will find uh, the Bianca's Garden Tour. So you can go over there and have a look. And then obviously you can book and you can go and do the experience and Bianca will be there for you. And then she will go through all this. And uh, now, before we leave, I have another small experience I want to speak with uh, who's following us. So I'm going to go back on my little presentation. And uh, I am going to show you, because we're speaking about fungus, right? So you're saying fungus. Well, uh, there are friend of friend of me, uh, which are really, really uh, young entrepreneurs uh, based in uh, Wilanga, or at least uh, they have been uh, developing their business uh, at the Wilanga Farmers Market. There's Phil and Brittany. Uh, they, are, uh, they are growing mushrooms. They started during the period of COVID uh, for uh, a sort of idea how, what to do, uh, working in hospitality, not job available. What can we do? We're going to develop this uh, uh, mushroom, growing mushroom business. And it was kind of successful so far. Uh, they have been, um, uh, they've been selling their mushrooms at the Wilanga Farm and Farmers Market and uh, the other farmers market. Uh, quite busy, I've been visiting the facilities, which actually they're really interesting to visit, trying to organize something with them. But what I would like to say is that uh, they decide to create a cooking, mushroom cooking masterclass, a sort of uh, experience where uh, people can discover more about exotic mushrooms 
and uh, the native mushrooms too, but also learn how to use them, uh, how to cook them, how to have a beautiful experience from uh, these uh, beautiful products, which are amazing. You can see the colors are unbelievable. And when I've been visiting, I thought, oh my God, I'm Italian. There are more than three mushrooms on the planet. Yeah, <laughs> that was really cool. Okay, so they are looking to have it running every week. We'll try to see what we can do. Obviously, I'm supporting them, giving my feedbacks and giving the opportunity to connect in the industry. So hopefully we're going to have this cooking class running every Thursday from uh, 6.30, 8.30, bookable on the Adventures platform. Otherwise, we can go to visit them uh, directly at the Wilanga Farmers Market every Saturday or the uh, other Farmers Market on Sunday. Okay, so I think that we have uh, done for this uh, Ag Adventures episode, new format. I'm really, really happy. It has much more sense now uh, than uh, just having me speaking about my stuff. Now there are more people interested to work together, which is really cool. So uh, thank you for being with uh, uh, us, guys. We're all back. All the microphones are on. Yeah. So thank you, Malcolm, for sharing uh, a little bit of tips and tips about the, uh, the predators and pests. And thank definitely, you. when we have a chance to come and visit in the, uh, your garden, uh, we'll, we'll, because it's really interesting. And then Bianca, well, I just finished to say, uh, thank you for sharing uh, your experiences and uh, also for um, uh, bringing in a little bit of the, uh, the, the science behind it, which is uh, really, really nice to have in pills. We don't want to read all the books, but a little <laughs> bit really cool. Thank you. And the thank you, Malcolm, uh, you ch uh, sent up the chat to let me know the word I was looking for with the mustard uh, preventing the bugs, biofumigant. Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. Something I haven't <laughs> seen. Sorry, I'm busy. Yeah, no, that's mind. right. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty good. Cool. Well, the main goal of Agri Adventures is to create a community of people that believe in sustainability, in food sustainability, and to use uh, possible organic or regenerative agriculture, but also, you know, increase the knowledge of people and appreciation. That's probably the most important thing. Mm. Okay. Thank you again. And uh, you. see you next time on uh, Agri Adventure. Marco, with you, maybe in a couple of weeks, we'll see what's going to happen. Huh? Happy with that, yeah. <laughs> Thank Love you, it. everyone. Thank you. Ciao, ciao, tutti. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Bye.